Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Scandrett. This is my wife, Lisa. We have had a fabulous weekend with many of you um, exploring, practicing the way of Jesus together this weekend. And um, I, I've gotten, I feel like I've gotten the grand tour of Heston. I've seen Mount Heston. Um, I, did, I didn't have the courage to climb it. Uh, it. It looked like it was too daunting for me. But I have run around some of the fake lakes around the retirement centers. <laughs> And I went, to, I visited the Arboretum this morning, so it's been, uh, uh, it's been a really wonderful time. Lisa and I are both originally from the Midwest. In fact, I've said this a couple times this weekend that my parents actually met up the road in McPherson. So I wouldn't even be on this planet if it wasn't for Kansas. So I'm especially grateful for that. But we have lived for the last 21 years in San Francisco, California. And Lisa and I have three young adult children, Haley, Noah, and Isaiah. And I don't know if you can quite tell from the picture, but our sons are large human beings. Um, I'm standing on my tiptoes in that photo. They're actually like 6'5 and 6'8 and um, bulging with huge muscles everywhere. Uh, so we look like the t- teeny little parents compared to the uh, t- to our boys. Um, we're co-founders of an organization uh, based in San Francisco, but now with a global reach called Reimagine. And we, our passion is to help one another put the teachings of Christ into everyday life in practical ways. And so we, um, this weekend, that was kind of our goal for being here together, that we would look at some of the things that Jesus said and did, and then together as a community, we would figure out how to put some of those things into practice. Lisa and I have um, written on some of these themes, and so uh, my, our talks this weekend were based on a book I, I wrote called Practicing the Way of Jesus. We have another one called Free, and the postures that you saw uh, with the Beatitudes this morning, it was so fun for me to see, the, uh, see us praying through the Beatitudes like that, are from a resource that I helped create called The Ninefold Path, A Journey Through the Beatitudes. This morning, we're talking from a book that we wrote a couple of years ago called Belonging and Becoming, Creating a Thriving Family Culture. Um, we think that family is an important place to work out what it means to be a follower of Christ. And of course, as, as you've already heard this morning, there's different levels of family life. There's the people that you live with, and then there's the people that you're related to, and there's the people that you love, whether or not you're connected to them by, um, by blood or by marriage. And in, and in a broader sense, we're all one huge human family as God's children too. So as we're talking this morning, we want you to kind of keep in mind all those different levels of what it means to be family. Does that make sense? So all of us are part of those different levels of family life. And I I was thinking as we were talking, there's a lot of different stages even to a biological family. There's there's the time when the kids are really, well, there's the time before kids, just like you were saying. There's the time um, when the kids are small and growing up. There's the time when they're heading out on their own and maybe beginning their own families. And um, there's the time when uh, we get to be grandparents. We're not there yet, but some of you are. Hoping for it. Can't wait. And, um, <laughs> and so I hope that as we're speaking today, you can remember the family that is yours right now and begin to imagine how some of the things that we're going to share with you might play out in your life at whatever stage of family you find yourself in right now. Um, I'd like to start by telling a little bit of our story about our own ache for family and how some of the things that we'd like to share with you came about for us. Um, You're looking at a picture of a very young Scandrette family up there. And um, our story goes back even further than that. Mark and I met when we were 15 and 16 years old. And... um, One of the first things I wanted to do was introduce Mark to my family. I'm from a big farm family in Minnesota. And so I had nephews and nieces and brothers and sisters who were married. And I wanted Mark to meet all those people. And as we started our family with just the two of us, we spent a lot of time with um, families where we lived who had experienced a lot of struggle and hardship in their lives. 
Um, many of them struggled economically. Um, they were struggling with the effects of addiction, um, the after effects of war, displacement, um, some of those things. And we spent a lot of time with those kids. A lot of times they'd wander over to our house after school and eat meals with us and we'd take them out on hikes. And um, we got close to lots of their families. And as we did, we began to wonder what makes a family able to thrive and what makes life difficult for a family. And it led to us dreaming about the family we'd like to have one day. And we'd brainstorm things. We'd say, you know, when we have, a, when we have our kids, we want our house to be a place full of laughter and fun and we want to be really connected. We want to be able to talk about everything in our family. Um, we wanted our home to be shaped by an awareness of God's presence with us. And we wanted to know what we were meant to do in life together. We wanted to do meaningful work together and have um, a greater sense of purpose we, we said, you know, we want to figure out what we're really good at. We were pretty young at the time, so we want to figure out what our gifts are and how we can use those gifts to serve the people around us. We want to have a lot of people in our house, and we want to show hospitality, especially to people who have a hard time finding their place, their place of welcome. We want to welcome those people into our home. We want to live gratefully, creatively, simply, and sustainably. We had these huge dreams. They sound good, right? We were talking about dreams this morning, and I heard some people's dreams in Sunday school, and I thought, these are good dreams, right? And um, we were young when we were dreaming this dream, and Mark had studied applied psychology and family development. I, had a, I was studying education, and so at that young age, we thought, we're really equipped for this dream. Like, we know all about good communication and child development. I think we can really nail this one. Don't you think so? Yep. <laughs> and so early on, we felt like we were on a good road to this. And then something happened that you see in the picture here. We had three kids in three years. And suddenly... Life became a blur of diaper changes and comforting children and getting up at all times of the night and deciding whose turn it was to get up. Mark was in seminary. He began working at a church. Um, life became really busy. And at the same time, we became aware of all the places inside of us that weren't quite developed enough to live into those dreams. And we had this ache because we realized that there was a gap between that beautiful dream we had and the life that we were living. Um, not that our life was bad, but it felt a bit chaotic and fragmented to us. And we were talking with a mentor, and um, that mentor encouraged us to stop and to ask, is normal working. If we continue doing things like we're doing them right now, is it going to lead us towards that dream? We had, a, we had a little house in the country. We had two cars in the garage. Mark was on a good professional track. But if we kept doing the things that seemed easy and seemed to be the next steps, would it lead us towards the kind of flourishing that we desired? Um, so we started to explore some new possibilities. We started um, thinking about the things from our families that were good, that we wanted to bring into this new family we were creating, and some things that we thought maybe we'd like to leave behind. We looked at people around us and began to say, you know, that family over there, they've got teenagers, and they seem really cohesive. What are they doing right? And we began to look at other mentors and heroes of ours to see what kind of choices they were making. We looked at the scriptures, we read some books, and based on all of that information, we decided to take some tangible new steps 
to try to live into this more whole and integrated life that we were being invited into. As you all know who were here with us this weekend, um, I'm very interested in sort of messing with our contract, so I just want to be aware um, this is called a sermon, and we, we have the microphones, and we're, we get to do the talking. But we think it might be meaningful to adjust our contract with each other. What if we could take a break right now from us talking and get you to talk a little bit? So I'm going to invite you to take a couple of minutes and turn to one or two people um, around you and respond to these two questions. What's one thing that you like about your family, your household, or your faith community? And... What's one challenge that you're facing with those you live with or love? So just take about two minutes and mention one or two things to one or two other people around you, and then I'll call you back together in just a couple minutes. For, thanks for letting me mess with the contract a little bit here. Hopefully you were able to identify something that you can celebrate, and then maybe you did identify a challenge that you're facing in one of the constellations of family that you're a part of. Well, what does Scripture have to say about family, or what, what, what can we get from when we look at the Scriptures? I grew up at a time where um, there was a lot of talk about the biblical family, which um, strikes me as a little bit funny because um, the families in the Bible really seem to struggle a lot. Let's go quick review. The first family mentioned Adam and Eve. One of their sons killed his brother. So if no one in your family has killed another family member, you're more healthy than the first family, okay? Uh, then you get to, uh, you know, the patriarch um, Abraham and I just read the scripture the other day again. He is, um, he's in a foreign city and he tells his wife, tell everybody you're my sister so that they don't kill me because you're so beautiful. And um, so imagine, I'm sure he was sleeping on the couch for months after that, right? And he passed that tendency on to his children. And then we get to uh, King David's family and there's a rape between, you know, a sexual assault between two of his children and a murder. And um, even Jesus struggled in his family relationships. Uh, there was a time where his mother and brothers 
thought he was crazy, and if he lived in our time, they would have been trying to get him committed to the mental health unit of the local hospital. So what I appreciate about this picture we get from the scriptures is that scripture is realistic about the pain that we can experience in our families. Most of us have some story of some difficulty or some drama in our, in our family background, and we're in good company uh, with the families in Scripture. But I don't think it ends there. I think Scripture is awful, also hopeful about the possibilities for newness to come to our family relationships. Uh, there's a place in the last book of the Hebrew Bible, the book of Malachi, where it gives a promise for families. It says, he will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. And it seems that with the coming of Messiah, um, this represented a, a whole new way of being a human being and consequently new ways that we can be together as families, more whole ways of being, uh, being family together. So one way I like to say this is, Whatever your family experience has been, it's not the end of the story. Uh, While we were working on this book, we had a chance to interview quite a few of of the people that we know and love about family life, and this struck us as a theme. I, um, I I have a friend who is in his middle 50s. He's raised three sons of his own, and he would often say, I never felt loved or accepted by my father. I always felt like I wasn't good enough, and there was this coldness and distance. And he partly attributed it to being um, from a Germanic family where they didn't show a lot of emotion. And that was the story he told about his family. But in the year or two before his father passed away, something shifted. And he said, Mark, something's different happening in my family. Whenever I see my father now, he gives me a hug, He gives me a kiss on the cheek. He tells me he loves me. And it's like I'm getting the father I never had. Another friend of ours grew up in quite a traumatic family situation where um, her father struggled with with his anger and, um, and actually physically assaulted her. And her and her three siblings were removed from the home because of his violence. And they grew up the rest of their life, their um, childhoods in foster care. And she's now in her mid-30s raising two children of her own. And she said, my dad has gotten into recovery. He's reconnected in his relationship with God. And he's actually become my primary spiritual support as I'm a single mother. He's becoming the father I never had. And hopefully, um, whatever the struggle has been in your family constellation, whatever whatever, um, mistakes or disappointments have, have been there, that we can live with the hope that it's not the end of the story, that there's still time. Um, we're, we're recognizing more and more in our age that family isn't just when, um, when you're raising kids and, and they're 18 and they're out of the house, that actually we're part of family our whole lives. And as Lisa mentioned, we just play different roles in that situation. I'm trying to prepare my, my children for this now. And as they were growing up, I'd say, um, you know, when, um, when you were small, I changed your diapers. And A time is coming where someday you might have to change my diapers. You know, we're going to reverse roles. And my daughter is always quick to point out, Papa, I think that I'll just leave that to the boys. You know, like I'll manage your finances or something else. But the point still stands. We're always part of these family constellations. And how can we seek God's wholeness and health in those relationships? And as adults, I don't think we're the only ones who think about what is this family thing. For lots of years, we got pictures to put on our refrigerator that looked a little bit like this. How many, how many of you have received a picture like this from a child in your life? I got a picture like this yesterday from, from a child in this congregation. It was pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. And I think that when kids draw pictures like this, they are beginning to try to figure out what is this family thing we're doing. When we got a picture like this, um, we'd stick it on the fridge, and once in a while we might ask a question, what do you like about our family, or what do you think our family is for? Like, why do we live in a family? 
As we were writing this book, we thought, I think we need to think about what do we mean when we say a thriving family? Um, Because that could mean a lot of different things. And as we were working through this book, this is the definition we began to work with. A thriving family culture, and you can think about this as your nuclear family or a church family, is a place of belonging and becoming, where each person feels safe, cared for, and loved, and supported to develop who they are for the good of the world. So I'd like to pick that apart a little bit. Um, There's two sides of this. There's the belonging and the becoming. And the belonging is having that safe space to grow up, to feel cared for, to go home after a bad day and get some support and encouragement. But we we don't want to just stop at being that nice, cozy, womb-like place. We need those places, but those places serve a, a bigger purpose. And it is so that we can do the hard work of becoming the people that we were meant to be, growing in character, growing in our gifts, so that we can go out to the people around us, the people that we live among, and bring the gifts that God has given us to that to them and to extend that belonging in places where there isn't belonging or where there isn't enough belonging. So we want to belong and become, not just for us, but so that all families on the earth can thrive. There's a couple of scriptures that um, point to this. Uh, First of all, uh, Jesus was somewhat critical of the understandings of family that were in his culture. Um, People said, Jesus, your mother and brothers are here to see you. And he said, who are my mother and brothers? those who do the will of God. So he's redefining family there. If we're not careful, our emphasis on family can lead to tribalism and a sense of me and mine and us versus them. And scripture calls us to not only care for the people that are closest to us by marriage and blood, but to see all people as part of God's bigger family. And Jesus did this. At the same time, Jesus was careful to also fulfill his obligations to the people he was related to by blood. And while he was giving his life on the cross, he looked down at his mother and turned to his friend John and um, had an exchange that basically meant, John, I'm the firstborn son in my family. I'm not going to be there to help my mom in her older years. Will you take on my obligation to care for my mom like this? And so there's both a deep commitment to those who are related to and connected to most closely, but also this understanding that we, we belong so that we all families on earth can thrive as well. So we want to invite you to consider a few pictures of what a holistic Um, gospel-inspired vision for family and community life might be. (coughs) As Lisa mentioned, my background is in uh, social work and family studies, and often in the literature, uh, you'll see lists of characteristics of family thriving. Some of these lists have five characteristics, some of them have 16. 16 is probably too many for anybody to remember. And so um, for our purposes, we want to we wanted present seven characteristics of family thriving that we think are rooted in Scripture and particularly the teachings of Jesus. Before we share them with you, I just want to say sometimes there's some of us who when we see a list of healthy characteristics, we actually use that list to beat ourselves up. And um, to say, oh, are, are, is my family system, our, our church community, are we measuring up on those things? I, I hope that you don't use this list in that way. What I'd like you to do is, as we go through these seven characteristics and just mention them, that you would think, how have, how have we experienced this in the family systems I'm a part of? And then maybe also pay attention to, Are there any of those seven characteristics that I long to deepen my experience with others in? Does that make sense? I don't want you to feel shame or should. I want you to hear invitation here. So the first one is that a thriving family or community lives from a deeper sense of purpose and a positive vision of the future that it can use as a guide for decision making. 
in the midst of life and the tasks that need to happen in a family or a church, it's easy to feel overwhelmed with just the dailiness and the tasks. And I definitely felt that way, particularly in our family when our kids were small and there were so many things to do. And a mentor of mine said, it seems like what's going to help you in the, in the midst of this is to really think about what your deeper purpose is as a family. So I went home that night, and Lisa and I sat down, and we talked, and we prayed, and we came up with a few things that we felt like we wanted to characterize or name what we wanted to be about as a family, what our purpose is. At the time, we said, and this is still our family purpose statement. We review it every year. We said, we want to love creator and creation. We want to nurture healthy family dynamics. We want to offer hospitality and care, especially to those who suffer and struggle. We want to use our gifts to serve, and we want to live simply, gratefully, and creatively. I was so excited about getting this, um, getting this down on paper and out of our mouths because it could give us a real vision that would help us make sense of all the things that we had to do each day. I photocopied it, and I put it on the front door of our house. We put it up in the kitchen, and we put it up in the bathroom so we would remember in all the tasks of our lives this is really the deeper purpose that we are, are wanting to be about. Jesus had a purpose statement. Uh, Luke 4, 18 to 20, he said, I- I'm here to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the wounded, to give sight to the blind, and proclaim the year of God's favor on all people. So it's clear to me that he lived out of that purpose statement, and I think we as families and communities are invited to do the same thing. A friend of ours is raising two uh, low, uh, low uh, functioning kids on the autism spectrum. And she said, our family purpose has to be really simple. She's raising those kids by herself, but um, w- along with her ex-husband, together they came up with a shared family purpose. And um, it goes like this. I love it because of its simplicity. She said, we want to pray. We want to be kind. We want to show respect. We want to be grateful. We want to love God and people. And we want to work on ourselves so that we have something else to give. So our encouragement for you today is if it's been a while since you've talked about family purpose as as who you live with, uh, to have a conversation about that. What is it that really matters to you? Another characteristic of the thriving family is the thriving family enacts household rhythms and policies that are life-giving and support the family's shared purpose. Once Mark and I agreed on what we wanted to be about together, we had to figure out how those things actually happened in life. And that was, you heard part of our story, like even before we had a family purpose, we kind of had a dream, we had an understanding, and that purpose articulated it, but we needed to figure out how to make those good things happen. And one thing that we found really helpful was to establish some rhythms in our family that... Um, reflected those purposes. So I like to think of rhythms as good habits that we create to allow the deepest values that we hold to shape the cadence of our life. If I had to wake up every morning and decide what I was going to do to live into our purpose every day, I probably wouldn't get to it because life gets really busy. But if I can establish some rhythms then those things begin to happen automatically without me thinking of them. Um, Our rhythms have shifted and changed over the course of our family's life so far, and I anticipate that they will keep growing and changing. So while your family purpose may stay the same, the way that you express it and live it out changes based on the ages of your family members and who's living in your household with you. We're kind of re-navigating some rhythms right now as our kids are grown. Um, But... There have been times in our life where we've had a hospitality night at our house. We just knew on Thursday nights, that's the night that we invite people over. Or for a while, there was a weekend, a month that with our community, we would visit our neighbors who lived underneath the freeway overpass and we would cook a meal with them and eat together where they live. Um, We had bedtime routines so that we could have some connection building together. We had this great rhythm that I loved for years that was called Dad and Kid Night. (laughs) And in these years, you saw how close the kids were in age, 
And for a time, I was home with the kids, and Mark was focusing his energy on our work, our shared work. Not that I didn't participate in it, but my primary focus was with the kids. And so I'm an introvert, and it was really important for me to get a little bit of space so that I could come back and parent well later. And so on dad and kid night, or mom's night out, whatever you want to call it, um, <laughs> Mark would come home, and I would promptly leave the house, and I would go out, and I would meet a friend. Sometimes I even got groceries or went shopping. It was just a luxury to do it alone. And they would be home, and they would do wild and crazy dad and kid things, like eat ice cream on the beach for dinner, or play games, or wrestle, or any of those things. And when I came home, everybody was in bed, sometimes even Mark. And, <laughs> and I would have that quiet evening to myself. But it was a good habit for all of us. It was good for me, but it was so good for Mark and the kids as well that if I was a little slow getting out the door, the kids would look at me and say, Mom, it's dead and kid night. Are you leaving? <laughs> and so that was another rhythm that was really helpful to us. So, um, like I, I said, can I say sometimes it's time to really reevaluate the rhythm as we've yep. traveled the country talking about family life. Uh, we've had many people talk about their aches about, um, being too busy as families mm -hmm. and distracted by too many activities, by work that takes them uh, too far from home. And we've had families say to us, we've, we've wrestled with this and made some trade-offs so that maybe I'm, we make less money, but we have a little more space or time to devote to the people closest to us. And so there are times in our lives where maybe that's the, the right choice. Sometimes we need to create space for some of those deeper, more important things and leave some good, but not as important mm -hmm. things behind. Third characteristic of thriving family and community is being receptive. Uh, cultivating uh, awakening to God's care and the larger story and learning to make ethical choices and adopt life-giving spiritual practices. I love a couple of pictures that we get from Scripture on this. Um, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he says, he says, parents, don't exasperate your kids. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. And I love the picture of this, that our job as as parents um, is, to, is to walk with our kids in learning the life-giving ways of Jesus. So that's more than just rules, and it's more than just um, instruction. It's saying, let's together discover what it means to be fully alive to our Creator, living in the reality of the kingdom of God. We're invited to be part of God's ongoing story, and we knew our kids loved stories, and so we spent a lot of time exploring stories together. And um, inspired by the, another scripture, Deuteronomy 6, where it says, um, here's, here's, the, here's God's command to you. Love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, it, and in that text, it says, talk about these things. When you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lay down, when you get up. And one of the important tools for families and communities is to create good conversation together. I think honest conversation about the real struggles in our lives and um, with awakening to what, let's reflect together about how we could live well in God's story together. So this picture would be a very common occurrence in our household. Intense conversation around the dinner table or the campfire, um, talking about things, wrestling with things together as a family. We think that can be so helpful. A thriving family is also connected. We relate with love and respect, pursue healthy ways to connect, communicate, navigate conflicts, and have fun. We found it really helpful as a family to talk about what does it mean to live with love and respect and set up some ground rules about um, what does that loving and respectful communication look like. Um, I grew up in a family and maybe, maybe some of you did here too, where conflict was not allowed. Did anybody else grow up in a family where there was no conflict? And by that, I don't mean that there wasn't occasion for conflict. I mean that we, we pushed it down, we swept it up under the rug, and we didn't talk about it. So when I entered our marriage, I didn't have very many tools 
for navigating conflict. Um, I thought that the best thing to do was to pretend that it didn't exist and then move on and, and kind of tell myself, oh, I'm just going to love Mark and we won't talk about this. But it became very difficult to do that. And so we needed, I needed to develop some tools and learn how to have that conflict because it was hard to do the other good communication and have fun together if there was something sitting there on my heart that was getting in between the two of us. So um, we, we developed some steps to take because I would get into that place where I knew that we had to have a conflict. So my first, the first thing I tried once I realized that we had to have conflict would just be to come at him, you know, like, this is how I feel. And that wasn't very good either. <laughs> And so pretty soon we decided, let's have some, let's have some steps we can learn um, for navigating conflict well. Can I just insert for just a second mm -hmm. that um, Jesus was realistic about this. He said, mm -hmm. forgive, you know, forgive me my debts as we forgive those who sin against us. That it's expected that because we're broken beings, we're going to end, our brokenness is going to end up rubbing against each other. So conflict's not a bad thing. It's something that we have to work through to, to be a reconciled community. And um, even from a brain science perspective, relationships are closer once we've worked through the conflict between us. So it's worth entering into as a family or as a community because we're going to be closer afterwards even if it doesn't feel very comfortable at the time so i'm going to share with you some of our steps in case it would be helpful for you to have some steps maybe you already have some good steps towards resolving conflict but they all probably have some sort of shape of these steps um, let me give you an example as we talk through these steps once upon a time Mark was very hurried to get out the door. He had a meeting that he was running late for. He had made himself a good breakfast so he'd have good fuel for his day. But he felt like he didn't have the time to clean up the kitchen before he went to his meeting. I, on the other hand, we live in a pretty small apartment and you can see the kitchen from every part of the house. So I, I often start my day or end my evening by making sure the kitchen is tidy so that my head is free to go about the other things of my day. So that day when Mark left the house to go to his meeting to honor his time commitment and leave the mess, I walked in and I felt like I just cleaned up the kitchen to get ready for my day and here it's a mess again. And I felt disrespected and unseen because the work I had just done had been undone. So when Mark came home, um, I didn't react well. I said, you don't think what I do is important. And you always leave you your always dishes. You always just leave a mess and think I'm going <laughs> to clean it up. However, and that, that began a conversation with us that didn't go well for a little while. Because how do you think Mark felt it's being not, received that way? I don't always leave the dishes. I sometimes leave the dishes. <laughs> so um, when we're doing things well, that conversation could have gone something like this. Mark walks in the door, and I say, hey, Mark, could we talk a minute? And he'll say, sure, we've got something we need to sort out. And then I could say, you know, I felt really frustrated this morning. I cleaned up the kitchen. I was ready to start my day. And then I came back in the kitchen and the dishes were here. And I felt really frustrated about that. And then Mark would have the opportunity to say, ah, I was in a real hurry. I meant to clean up my dishes, but I was already running late for my meeting and I had to head out the door. So step two would be to listen to each other. Um, step three would be to own your part. Now, in the first scenario, I would need to own my part by saying, I made some unfair accusations to you. Um, 
I said that you always leave a mess and that you don't care about me, and those things aren't true. I'm sorry for making those kinds of accusations to you. And I need to say, I didn't clean up, and that's our contract in our house. How can I make this right? Yep. And so that brings us to step number four, to give and receive forgiveness. So if I said, Mark, the way I spoke to you just now wasn't right, will you forgive me? Mark can say, yes, Lisa, I'll forgive you. And if he says to me, yeah, I did leave a mess. I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me? This is my opportunity to say, yes, Mark, I forgive you for leaving a mess. And, and we remind each other in step five, I love you. you love know. you too. <laughs> and, and we might give a hug. And step number six would be to explore solutions. What can we do next time so that this doesn't happen? And our solution that time was for Mark to say, you know what, if this happens again, I'll try to let you know, I'm in a hurry, I can't do my dishes, but you can just leave them, and when I come home, I'll clean up after myself. Um, but because I'd already cleaned up very begrudgingly, he said, you know what, how about if I do the dinner dishes tonight? I'll, I'll clean up after dinner, so you don't need to do that. Now, Hopefully it goes very smoothly like I just outlined here. It, it doesn't always go that smoothly, but we have those steps we can return to when we get lost in the middle of the conflict and go, oh wait, where are we at here? Have I listened or have I made assumptions? And we can go back to that pattern until we can figure out how to become reconciled with one another. Now this is really important for Mark and I to be able to be a unified couple but it's also really important for us when we wrong our children to go through these same steps. Uh, when we were writing this book, we had our kids look over the manuscript ahead of time because we knew that this book was going to go out into the world. I didn't want the kids to look at it later and go, boy, what family are you talking about? You know. And um, as we were talking through this, we'd also say, our kids were in early college at the time, what do you, what do you think people should know? And our daughter said, I have a lot of friends whose parents don't admit when they're wrong. And she said, I think it's because they're afraid that their kids won't respect them if they admit that they have fault. She said, the problem with that is, is we all know when our parents wrong us, if our parents speak harshly or they didn't listen or they were unfair to us. So when you and dad apologize, when you've done something wrong, it helps me to know that you, that you um, respect me and love me. It builds trust in our relationship. So it's really important for people to know that when they do something wrong towards their kids, that it's okay to ask for forgiveness. And she said the other thing is it makes it okay for me to make a mistake I have to apologize for too. Because if mom and dad can wrong me, then... I probably wrong other people too, and it's okay for me to be wrong and to apologize. So I think that's really important work, and it's really important work to help our kids know how to reconcile with each other as well. It can be hard work, and it can take a long time to help our kids walk through a conflict with each other help them get to the point where they're willing to not just say, hey, say you're sorry, say you're sorry, but lead them through that really understanding the other person's point of view. Um, some of the hardest work I ever did as a parent, but when they learn to do those things, not only can they have reconciled relationships with one another, but think about if we all had the skills to do this, what we could bring out into our communities as far as reconciliation and into our broader world if we knew how to go through this process of really listening to one another and giving and receiving forgiveness. A, another characteristic of thriving family is, and community is that we're responsive, that we celebrate each person's belovedness, hold their brokenness, and support their growth. Uh, years ago, um, when our kids were in grade school, we got invited to lots of uh, birthday parties on the weekends. I, has anybody been in that situation where lots of birthday parties going on? Um, sometimes it would be two 
or uh, three birthday parties in one day or one weekend. And I'm not complaining because these were pretty fun parties where there was good food for the adults too. Uh, But one time we were on our way home from one of those birthday parties and our son Isaiah said, Dad, pull over the car. And I pulled over to the curb. He opens the door and he just projectile vomits out into the gutter. And I get out and I go to support him and um, and he calms down and um, I get back in the car and, I, and we're like any concerned parents, Lisa and I are like, Isaiah, is it something you ate at the party? Are you, are you getting the flu? And then Isaiah, Lisa said, Isaiah, what did you eat at the party? And he said, well, I had, um, I had five pieces of lasagna. And I, and I said, well, that's a lot of lasagna for an eight-year-old eight-year-old body. Um, what else? And he said, uh, I had like seven or eight pieces of French bread. That's also a lot. And I had eight or nine of those big brownies. And I had three big scoops of the M&Ms that they had on the table. And I had seven glasses of lemonade. Where were the parents of this child? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, son, no wonder you are feeling not well because you put enough food in your body for our entire family. And he starts to tear up and I said, son, hey, I wasn't trying to shame you about that. What's wrong? And he says, I got to throw up again. And he opens the door, (laughs) more vomit in the gutter. And he gets back in and he says, dad, I need an experiment in truth. And I know that's a weird thing for an eight-year-old to say. But it's language that he'd heard at at our house. And I think what he was thinking of was that there used to be this stranger that would show up at our house unannounced, not even knock at the door, walk right into our apartment and start barking orders at our family members. Pick this up and why is this backpack here? And why aren't these dishes put away? And this stranger would totally wreck the vibe of our house. And we would all be like, why does this person think they have the right to do this? And he would repeatedly show up at our house month after month. And finally, our kids gave this stranger a nickname. They started calling him Krabby Dad. And I know our message is getting a little long, but uh, in case, just in case you're a little slow on the uptake, I am Krabby Dad. I was that stranger. And I would get like this at our house where I would be like, ah, raging. And sometimes he'd even pray in the moment, serenity now, or God help me to be a loving husband and father right now. And those prayers were never answered in the moment. And part of it was realizing actually how our character is developed. And I realized that if I didn't want crabby dad to show up at our house, I would need a new life pattern. And I thought about, why does Krabby Dad show up? Krabby Dad shows up when Mark Scandrett works too many hours, when he doesn't exercise, and then when he copes with it by soothing with things like lots of coffee and lots of sugary snacks, and then he works so hard so he feels like he needs a little more relaxing, and so he'll stay up late flipping channels or binge-watching something, and then he doesn't get up very early, and he doesn't exercise or spend time in prayer, and then he rushes off to do more of the work. Why is Mark Skandart working so hard? Why isn't he taking a day off? Because he believes that he's only valuable because of what he can achieve in his work. And when I realized this, I thought, "I I need to cooperate with God's work in me. Change the script about my identity and learn some new habits in my body. And so I made some commitments to rest, to exercise, to sleep, to decreasing caffeine and sugar. And gradually, but very dramatically, Crabby dad stopped showing up at our house. And it was dramatic enough that our kids remembered him being there. And then they're like, hey, we don't see that guy anymore. Uh, Not that we miss him, but something's changed. And our kids learned from that. Our dad has problems, but our dad is committed to a path of discipleship. If dad can grow and change, so can we. And as families and communities, We can hold each other's brokenness with a lot of grace and also encourage each other to follow life-giving steps of discipleship that help us to grow and change. A thriving family is also resourceful. It lives abundantly, using its resources wisely, practicing gratitude, trust, contentment, and generosity. I know that this is something that your tradition explores quite a bit. Um, 
the questions of what is a right-sized life? How much do we need? How can we live simply so that other people can have the things that they need? And um, having these intentional conversations and making intentional decisions around this as our families are growing up together um, helps us to um, think about those decisions and make them wisely and plant the seeds for that kind of gratitude and contentment. Finally, a thriving family is productive. It celebrates each person's uniqueness and it supports the development of skills and capacities to serve others and pursue the greater good. There are five people in my family. Each one of us is a really unique person. We each have our gifts and our skills and our talents and our struggles. And we've wanted to become students of one another. And what I mean by that is noticing who, is, who are these people that I live with? How are they wired? What is the good thing that God has for them to do in the world? Um, sometimes I think about this category as work. So there's a few different kinds of work in the family. There's the chores, the, the running of the household that we can all participate in together so that we're building capacity and learning how to do good functional things. There's the, there's the work that we can explore of serving others, and we can do that together as a family. And then we can begin to plant seeds for our kids based on the things that, well, and for one another too, by looking at each other and saying, what is the thing that you're meant to do and how can I help you do that thing? This is our middle son, Noah. One of Noah's very first words was actually. And that gives you a really good clue to his personality. Noah was a noticer. Um, he liked to observe the world and figure out how things work and then let other people know how they actually work. So um, Even when he was two years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we began to notice this about Noah, and we thought, what are the things that will help this kid become even more who he is meant to be? Um, so we began to look for opportunities to put him in contact, not just with resources, but with other people who might share his same gifts and passions. When he was in grade school, um, he got to be part of a class where they'd wander about in nature for hours a day. And somebody there took him under his wing, and he had an interest in birds, and that person kind of fed that and helped him have information about that, even had him help teach younger kids the things that he had been learning. When he was in his teen years, he worked at a hands-on science museum, and um, this is just fun. He got to have the title of explainer. That was his job. He got to explain things to the visiting public at the museum about how, th how things worked at that museum. And along the way, we'd talk with him about, you're really persistent. You've got this gift for looking at a problem and working on it over and over and over and over until you get it. You know, people like you can solve some really difficult problems in our world. Things like, how do people in certain parts of the world get enough water? How can we build smarter solar cells so that uh, we can get energy and better ways for our world? I wonder what you might do with your gifts and talents. So Noah went on to university. He got a degree in physics. He was able to work in a lab with um, one of his professors, um, working on better little energy cell gatherers. I don't even, he could tell you all about it. It's hard for me to explain. And now he's graduated and he's beginning to say, how do I want to take all these skills that I have and what is that meaningful thing that I want to move towards in the world? And I'm really excited to see where he goes. And we have the privilege of walking alongside each other and encouraging each other towards those things. We want to wrap it up here and just uh, af offer you a couple of encouragements. One is kids and younger people help create family culture. 
It's not about perfection. You start with where you're at and say, how do we want to deepen our experience of the kind of family and community that God invites us into? Embrace your power to make, to make changes. It takes cooperation and work. And our encouragement is that if the things we've shared today have prompted something in you, to have a conversation with people you live with or love this week about the kind of family and relationships you want to have together. Thank you.